everybody, welcome into the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust, proud legacy partner of the Chicago Cubs, an exclusive home of Cubs Checking. Open online today at Wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. As a reminder, we're available on all podcast platforms, so be sure to rate and subscribe. Tony and Draghi here, joined by Andy Martinez. And in a couple minutes, we're actually going to be joined by Kyle Farnsworth. We had a very special guest on this week's podcast, the 16-year big league veteran, pitched from 1999 to 2014, including six years with the Cubs. He was a 47th round draft pick by the Cubs. Many people know him for his takedown of Paul Wilson in 2003, uh, the Cincinnati pitcher that charged the mound. He talks a little bit about that, but then he also talks about his perspective watching the Steve Bartman play happen during the NLCS and how he was warming the bullpen just a few feet away. Uh, So it was a great chat with Kyle Farnsworth. We talk about what he's been up to now, so let's get right to it. All right, welcome into the Cubs Weekly Podcast, Tony Andraki, Andy Martinez, and we're joined by special guest Kyle Farnsworth. Kyle, thank you so much for hopping on and chatting with us today. Of course, thank you for having me, guys. So first up, uh, you know, what have you been up to in your baseball or since your baseball career has ended? We've seen that you've gotten very into bodybuilding. How did that career switch come about? And really, is that been the main focus of your post baseball career? Um, no, I've always been into working out. I think that's what made me successful. You know, with my baseball career was uh, being in the gym, lifting, staying healthy, you know, with shoulder health, and just overall flexibility and strength. Um, you know, so I started working out. I think probably really got in, introduced into it probably my freshman year in college down at ABAC and just, you know, I really just enjoy, enjoyed it. Um, you know, just, you know, trying to do everything I could to make myself better um, on the field performance wise, um, you know, health wise, you know, I saw all positive things, you know, it was just something that I stuck with and, and I believe it helped me, you know, stay pretty much, you know, not all the way injury free, but for injury free, pretty much my whole career, especially my arm, you know, I don't think I, I never really had any really, real issues um so i contribute that to a lot of you know training in the gym you know the awesome trainers that we have the rehab stuff that they do for us um for our shoulder and stuff like that you know it's it's awesome so you know i just fell in love with you know just working out you know how it helped my body and then you know i figured you know since i'm done playing um you know i'm in the gym all the time anyway so might as well try to do something um you know, to compete, you know, I've always tried, had that thought I've always wanted to. So I said, you know, what the heck, I'm an old man. So what's the worst can happen? <laughs> so how much do you watch baseball or, or pay attention? Are you a, an avid fan of, of major league baseball still in your post-playing career? Or um, has that kind of taken a bit of a backseat for you? It's taken a little bit of backseat. Um, I'm just the way the business side has been run, being run now these days is kind of just, uh, a disappointment to me. Um, I hate saying that I'm old school because I'm really not, but um, it's just, it's, just, it's it is a different game, but that, you know, that's part of it. The game changes with each generation and each, each decade. So it's just part of, you know, the uh, analytic part has, I think has overtaken the game way too much as opposed to the, the part of just letting the athletes play the game. They see the game and how they feel as opposed to the end like part, you know, there, there's goods and there's pluses and negatives with, with everything. So there's nothing wrong with the Atlantic analytic part, but you just can't make it hundred percent of the game as opposed to it's a, it's a person versus person game. So you have to let the athletes play. So, but you know, I really haven't watched that much baseball. You know, I think I'll watch it in the playoffs and maybe, you know, I play some fantasy baseball, so maybe I'll watch a game every now and then. But as far as watching it, like some guys do, I don't do that that much anymore. Um, I do a lot of training with kids um, down here in Florida, you know, help them with pitching, hitting, um, physical fitness and stuff like that. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's been a lot of fun. You mentioned the, the changing in the game, something that changed. You were drafted in the 47th round. There, that round doesn't even exist nowadays in the NBA draft. How much, how much was that a motivation for you as you're working your way to try and prove to other teams, to yourself, that, hey, I, I can be a major leaguer even though I was drafted so late? Yeah, I mean, I think that was a you know, bad move by the commissioner as well because, you know, you can find him. Mark Burley is another example. Mike Piazza, you know, those were two guys who were drafted, and I, you know, I think Piazza was in 60-something. Burley, I think he was in the late 40s or 50s. So, I mean, there are guys that are still able to – perform being drafted in the late rounds as opposed to guys you know first first 10 round guys I know I I outworked outperformed guys who were had better than talent than me 
just because I had the want the you know we all had the ability but I had the you know more desire the, the more want and that's that's what's frustrating to see as well that you know they get rid of those kind of rounds and minor league teams where you guys have you can find guys a diamond in a rough a lot very easily because there's so there's so much talent now especially these days with the better training and stuff like that so it's you know i think it's a shame that they've cut their rounds to that short when you look back at your career what are you most proud of are you most proud of you know defying the odds i guess and coming from a 47th round rounder to a 16 year career or is it staying healthier like what do you look back on your big league career and say this is what i am most proud of um probably as long as i played um especially also being drafted into 47th round so i'm probably a mixture of both because, you know, I, there were a lot of odds stacked against me. There were way many more people drafted ahead of me. And even, even er, year after year, there was always guys being drafted to take my spot. So I had to continue to improve, perform, and show that I still had ability for, you know, for as long as I played for the minor leagues, all the way to, you know, 2014. So for almost 20-something years, I was, you know, battling and playing hard and doing whatever I could do to keep that guy behind me who wants my job away from me. So, um, so a mixture of both just staying healthy and playing as long as I did and to find the odds of, you know, just being, being the kind of an afterthought of a 47th round draft pick. Like I will we'll take this guy. He'd be all right, but who knows? <laughs> kind of going off of that. I mean, you started, you came up as a starting pitcher, then you, it, was it some adversity when you get moved to the bullpen to try and transition to that role, or how does that come come about? Is that is there a mental switch? Is there what 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 kind of goes into that? It's a little bit of a mixture of both. Um, probably the main reason why I got switched to the bullpen because I really didn't have a quality third pitch. You know, I had a good fastball and a decent slider, but I didn't have that other other good good quality pitch. Um, so, but as far as you know, mentally wise, it took a little bit difference because you knew starting you'd pitch every fifth day so you could have a set plan set routine um in the bullpen you had to be yourself or be mentally prepared and physically ready pretty much every day and i think that was the biggest maybe biggest switch in mind mental part of the game that i had to be ready every day as opposed to every fifth day but you know i love taking the ball every day you know i i think one time when i was there with the cubs i think dusty was manager i think i pitched I loved it. I, and I I was young, but I think I pitched like nine out of 11, 11 games. You know, I was like, get this, give me the ball, give me the ball. I'm good. Give me the ball. And that's, that was just my mentality. So, but no, I think that's also where the physical fitness, the training, the nutrition and stuff had to come and play as well to take care of your body. So you can be able to perform that many, those many times in a row. And you know, it's going to wear on you later on in the season just to be healthy for the team as well. So Kyle, your breakout season really kind of came in 2001 when you did transition to the bullpen full time with the Cubs. You had a 2.74 ERA, 24 holds that year. What, what do you attribute to really kind of coming into your own that year as a reliever? And I think you had what 76 games pitched. So basically, you said almost every other day throughout the season that year. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly can't, can't put my finger on it. Um, it's just you know, sometimes things just click for guys, and then you know I think in 2002 or 2000 was an awful year and 2002 wasn't a good year. So I, I don't know. It's one of those, <laughs> that's what, that, that's what makes baseball so weird that it's, it's a constant up and down, you know, some guys can, can do it, you know, consistently for a long time. You know, I, I'm, I know I'm, I was no slouch either for 16 years, but you know, I had good years and I had bad years. You know, I really couldn't understand why I would have a good year. You know, I obviously being aggressive, you know, make quality pitches. You know, I tried to do the same thing every year, but sometimes, the year wouldn't turn out the way as a good year. So uh, as far as trying to really pinpoint exactly what happened, I, I honestly ha don't have an answer for that. It's just one of those things that just, it just happens. You get in the zone and you, you just stay consistent with delivery. You know, obviously little injuries here and there make it or, or play into your performance, your mechanics. You change something a little bit differently subconsciously or stuff like that. So um, I try to do anything any differently year to year. I just try to just be as ready as possible. You mentioned that or we're talking about the 2001 season. You're coming off a 97 loss season, the season before. What was the environment like throughout the 2001 season amongst your personal success, but also pitching, you know, in a playoff race up until, you know, right, right, right up towards the end? No, our mentality was, you know, we had a great team and I think the what I really remember about that team, everybody 
really meshed and got along real well. And I think that's key for any team to be successful, to have great clubhouse chemistry. Um, I remember back in those days, I mean, we'd sit in the clubhouse, you know, I wouldn't smoke cigarettes, but, you know, the guys, the guys would be still be smoking cigarettes, or drinking beer, and we'd be talking about baseball. Uh, you know, that's what I came up with in the 99 through probably around 2001, 2002. Then it kind of started getting away from that because guys were trying to hurry up and get out of the clubhouse. But I learned a lot from or just being around you know, Rod Beck, you know, rest, is, rest in peace for him, Rick Aguilera, Terry Mulholland, Jeff Glauser. A lot of those, Girardi was, there, you know, a lot of those older guys, we'd sit in the clubhouse with Martin Grace and we'd just sit, hang out and just talk about baseball. And I think that's, you know, for, especially for that 2001 team, you know, even, even we'd go out together as a team, you know, 10, 15 guys deep, you know, just, you know, we had great chemistry and camaraderie. And I think that's what really helped us, you know, play well that year. What, why does the, like, what is it about the chemistry? Like, does it, does it give you confidence? Like what, what does it specifically do to help lead to success? It, it gives confidence and, and you can, and it gives you trust in that the guy next to you as well. You know, there's always trust, but you, you really respect each other really trust each other and know that the person next to you will have your back and is all going to be always going to be there for you. It's like, you know, just going out and doing it by yourself or you want your whole team right there with you. And we all had the same goal. We all had the same mindsets. You know, there wasn't really any straggler who was, you know, doing this, doing that. Everybody really had a goal that we had, we were a really good set team and we could win. So the Cubs obviously hired Dusty Baker as their manager before the 03 season. For you guys in the clubhouse with the players, like, was there a buzz about hiring of, of him as a manager? And was there like a level of excitement that like, you know, you have this this very well-known manager coming in and, and being the skipper of you guys' team? Yeah, I mean, we heard great things about him. Uh, you know, he was, I think he was with the Giants, he was with the Giants, I think, before. And, you know, I mean, he was probably one of the best. Oh, sorry about this. This, this is Oso. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our blue nose. but yeah he was you know dusty is probably one of the best managers that I played played for you know he was up front told you how it was whether you liked it or not he had your back and i think that's what you really want as a manager is to just them to be honest and to tell you the truth whether you like it or not whether it's good or bad and you know he let us play and he knew how to put the right guys in the right situations and keep the team, team together. If you needed to slap some people around, he would do it. And if you needed to patch up, like he would. And that's what you know made him pretty great. You mentioned Dusty Baker. I'm curious, did, what was your reaction when you saw him this, just this past October finally win a World Series as a manager, having played for him and, and seeing the reaction for, for, for him in that moment? Uh, I'm very, very happy for him. Could have happened to a better manager. I mean, for what he, he has done for the game, you know, day in and day out, he's always been there. He went into a terrible situation with Houston with right after what, what happened, how he was able to keep that team together as well. You know, so it was unfortunate what happened with them, but he was able to keep that team together, you know, with all the bad press and still keep that team focused on winning constantly. So, I mean, for what he's able to do with, with them, obviously they're a great team, great talent, but still there's so much outside noise, especially with that situation, how he was able to defer that off of the players and put it, kind of put it on him in a way to just let his guys go out there and play. All right, Kyle, we want to hear more about your career and your Cubs tenure, but first a quick word from our sponsor, and then we'll come back and continue our chat. Get your Wintrust exclusive debit card. Get your Cubs card. Ooh, I'll take one. How much? Actually, they pay you $300. You heard right. Get a $300 bonus when you open a Cubs checking account with Wintrust. Enjoy all perks and purchase with pride every time with your Wintrust Cubs debit card. $300? What? $300? Get your exclusive card at Wintrust.com slash Cubs. Only $100 required to open. No monthly minimum balance and no monthly maintenance fees. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. In 2003, that you guys kicked off September with that five-game series against the Cardinals at uh, at Wrigley Field. You guys were like just a game and a half behind the Cardinals and Astros in the in the Central at the time. That season, you got to to pitch in the postseason at Wrigley, and like we said in 2001, it was you know almost like that. It was playoff type vibes, obviously down the stretch. But what is it like at Wrigley Field? to be pitching in that type of environment with that type of energy? And how much different was that even than earlier in the year than an April or a May game when you're in September and October in a playoff race and, and pitching for a, a packed Wrigley Field? 
you know, that's what you dream about as a kid in your backyard when you're playing with your friends or whatnot. Uh, sorry, here, here's Georgia. She wants to say hi, too. Oh, nice. <laughs> But yeah, you know, it, I mean, the, the atmosphere and the excitement, you know, it goes up 100%. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of a silly cliche, but, you know, that you, you can feel the difference between the playoff atmosphere and just a regular, you know, start of the season or May atmosphere. You know, every game obviously counts or you wouldn't be able to play in, in, uh, in the September or in the playoffs. So, you know, even those games in, you know, April and May, they count, obviously. But to get to the – because oh, – only way to get there is to win those games and get to the playoffs. So, but I mean, Wrigley, that place was, I mean, I remember the electricity was insane there. I mean, the fans are there, I mean, nonstop day in and day out anyway, but when you throw the playoff push inside in with them and playing that night game too, they, it's just a great feeling, you know, you get hyped up even more, but you still got to stay under control and relax. So, you know, you don't want to go too crazy and to stay within yourself and to still perform. Did you ever take a moment, especially in those playoff games or, or in those electric atmospheres, to kind of soak it in and just think you, the, the journey that you had gone on from, from all the adversity to, to pitching in, in the biggest games in baseball? A, a little bit I did. You know, that is something that, you know, I definitely wanted to make sure I, I did take in. I was like, wow, I, I did it. I made it. I made it this far to the playoffs. You know, did it far further than a lot of people thought I would make it, and even myself. <clears throat> Excuse me, but you know, it's you know just to be able to see again, again like I said, the excitement of how the town was, um, just the guys as well. You know, a lot of those guys, you know, it was their first times in playoffs. As you know, you know, it was just a very exciting feeling. I wish a lot of you know everybody could have that feeling just one time, so they can know understand what we're talking about. So Kyle, as we're talking about 2003, like we all know what happened, obviously, in the NLCS there. Um, and as Cubs fans are well versed in Cubby occurrences and things like what happened with Bartman, uh, had you ever heard the term Cubby occurrence before? Or like how familiar were you with that? And then how much did you guys even talk about the potential curse of the Billy Goat and something that fans and media talks about a lot? But curious in the clubhouse if that's anything that was even on your guys' radar. Um, not really. I mean. <laughs> I mean, it's, I feel sorry for Bartman or what happened. I mean, anybody anybody in the stands would have gone for the ball and it just happened to him. Do I think Moises could have caught it? Yeah, he definitely would have caught it. But I think what happened, you know, a lot of people don't talk about is, you know, right after that, there was a routine ground ball hit to Alex. And he said, I remember talking to him afterwards. He said that ball had the weirdest, weirdest spin that he's never seen a spin like that on a ball hit to him and it when it hit his glove he said it just spun out she said it was the weirdest thing he's ever seen he's never seen anything like it so i mean like i said a lot of people don't talk about that i mean i love him to death he's a great guy but you know there's a ground ball double play that should have been turned um so but yeah it but we you know when that happened we knew we had wood coming in for you know for the last game so, um, you know, it was unfortunate we lost that whole series, but, you know, we still thought we had our chances to win um, that last game as well because, you know, prior to that game and then Wood the, for game seven. So, um, you know, it's it very unfortunate. So uh, you – I don't know if you were warming exactly when the, the Bartman incident happened and when Alou – you were? Yep. So, because I know you were the first pitcher to relieve prior there, but like, what was your perspective in that? Because obviously, obviously, back then the bullpens were right there, so you probably had the best view of anybody on the Cubs team, other than Moises, as to what happened. Like, what was your perspective, and just what was going through your head even in that moment? At first, I thought I was going to be out of play, but then I was watching Moises, and I was just watching the ball, and I was like, all right, he's got a chance to catch it when he jumped up. I never saw Steve reach up for it, but I was, I was just waiting for Moises to catch the ball and bring it back from the from obviously inside in the stands <clears throat> excuse me and then that's when i saw barman reach up for it and hit him hit him in the hands and i was like oh no that just happened and i was like they, they have to call interference but no because it was obviously in the uh, you know in the stands not in the field of play he didn't reach over and it, it just sucked but you know he definitely would have caught that ball if no one was there there was a, a, another moment in, in the 03 season we had ryan dempster on our podcast not too long ago, uh, the Paul Wilson incident, and he kind of told us. About <laughs> what was your? Uh, were you surprised when when all that happened when he charged the the mound? 
Yes, I, I was very surprised. I, did, I honestly did, had no idea the reason why he did until afterwards. So I think what happened was that Pryor hit Jason LaRue, and then I think Wilson then hit Pryor. No, I had no idea. I'm in the bullpen, so I'm just, you know, just relaxing, chilling out there, you know, watching the game. But I didn't, that wasn't even a thought process in my mind. Then when I come in, I think we were losing three to two and already had a runner on first base. Last thing I want to do is hit Paul and put two guys on <laughs> with no outs. You know, the ball just got away from me, kind of up and in. And I guess, he, you know, uh, he just didn't – take too kindly to it and then okay I get it but I definitely was not trying to hit him it definitely surprised me when he came out after me and the reason why I went towards home because it's obviously a pass ball and I was covering home you know because it's an open base the guy in second never know it was just reaction for me to walk towards home and people would say oh you instigated because you walked towards him no I was walking towards just to cover home plate right and so you know that's when he said some cuss words towards me and I said some cuss <laughs> words towards him and then that's when he threw his bat down. And I, I just reacted through my glove and picked him up, threw him down, and tried to get a couple of shots in before the uh, dog pile. How often are you asked about that? Because you laughed as soon as, you know, you are probably get asked about that all the time, right? Yes, pretty pretty much. Uh, they're probably, you know, multiple times, you know, if I go out and just rain a person, that you know, that's the first thing I say or a, a golf <laughs> yeah. event or something. But – you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm glad I'm remembered in some, some way or shape or form. <laughs> do, do you, do you have a, a personal connection then to Cincinnati or what is your favorite city that, that you traveled to that you played in when you, when you were a major leaguer? Um, besides Atlanta, I get, because I grew up in Atlanta, they're, you know, the team I watched, you know, Dale Murphy and all them. Um, I really like Colorado. That area out there is super nice. It's a beautiful stadium. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I played with uh, Kansas City, it was a nice area out there too. You know, it was an older stadium, but they remodeled it and did it did it awesome. You know, I love that area out there. I'm more of a country person. That area is easy to get around it, and it's kind of countryish out there too. So, um, you know, Tampa. When I played there, I stayed here at home, so I could travel back and forth. I was able to be with my kids and family pretty much all the time, as opposed to be on the road. So there's a few good cities I would be able to play in. Who were some of your favorite teammates that you got to chance to play with at any stop in your career, Chicago or otherwise? And I know we're kind of putting you on the spot, but just guys that either had an impact or ended up developing like lifelong friendships with. Um, Scott Proctor, when I played with him with the Yankees and Braves, we still keep in touch a lot. You know, he, he lives down here in Florida as well. So we stay in touch. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Luke Scott, when I played with him in Tampa, Johnny Damon. Uh, we still keep in touch. Um, Corey Patterson, every now and then, I was actually one of his pitching coach because he does a collegiate summer league in, in Atlanta area, and he was a, he's a head coach there. And I went up there and was, was a pitching coach for him one time, so it was that was a lot of fun. Um, but pretty much those guys, probably about it. You know, there's probably some other ones here and there, but um, not too many. Just a small little circle of guys that we still hang out with. Who were some of the guys that you? Th- learned a lot from especially as a young pitcher um coming up that like maybe were some sort of mentor to you throughout your career terry, terry mulholland definitely was he he took me under his wing and helped me out um and just kind of showed me the ropes try to make sure i didn't get in too much trouble but that didn't work too well there. <laughs> <laughs> but no he was he was he was awesome just i i can't say so, too much i mean so much stuff about him is just you know he, he had no reason to do it. He just did it. And, you know, it was just very thankful for him to do that. People have always – relievers have always talked about those final three outs, getting those final three outs in a game or the hardest three outs. Do you feel that way? And if so, what is it about that ninth inning that makes it that, – that it's so difficult to, to get those final three outs? I think it can be. I think it's just all mental. Um, you know, I think when I would – struggle or had a tough time doing it I think I was just af- afraid to mess up as opposed to just attack the hitters and whatever happens happens um, because I wouldn't be aggressive I'd be more timid but when I figured out, I was like you know what here I come and my first you, you can't get me I'm, I'm coming at you whether you like it or not I'm gonna get these three outs and you can't stop me and that's when I kind of you know 
just let things happen. If I make my make a quality pitch, I got guys behind me as well, as opposed to trying to think that I have to do everything myself. I think that was when it really kind of switched and changed that I have it have my team behind me, as opposed to no, I got to do it all myself. So it, it it definitely is making it harder, especially on the road, because if you give up runs, the game's over. At least at home, if you do, your team still comes to bat, but you still don't want that to happen. You still want to get those three outs and just get, get the game over with. Kyle, last one for you before we let you go. Um, I know you said you coach and obviously do a lot of camps. What's the best piece of advice that you give to to young baseball players who are aspiring to go on to have a professional career? Um, I mean, it's kind of hard to narrow down just to one thing. I, it also depends on their their age. But the main thing I try to tell people is just have fun. As soon as you start <coughs> taking the fun out of the game and trying to make it a job at that age and trying to like parents make these kids go to all these tournaments nonstop baseball year round, the kids are going to get burned out or injury or something like that. It's going to happen and, and they're not going to play anymore. Mm -hmm. So the main thing I try to tell the parents as well, just make sure you keep your kids involved, make them have fun, but don't press it on them so much that they end up hating the game. And I see that happening a lot, especially with injuries and kids that's getting burnt out because they're, playing year round and it's just nonstop. So pretty much just make, make sure that they have fun and just, just enjoy the process. Well, Kyle, thanks so much for stopping by the Cubs weekly podcast here. We really appreciate catching up with you and uh, reminiscing on some of the times at Wrigley field that you had. Thank you guys very much for bringing me on and be able to tell lies and tell <laughs> what happened. <laughs> I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Andy, that was an awesome chat we had with Kyle Farnsworth. There's a lot of good things. I know our social media coordinator, Kyle Milanovic, loves the Paul Wilson thing. So it was really cool that we got Farnsworth's uh, perspective of that. But like, what kind of stood out? Was it that moment, that story that he told that really stood out to you from this chat? Yeah, it was definitely that part, hearing his perspective of he was just trying to cover home plate. Like th that, yeah. was, that was kind of that was a fun part of that conversation. But also just his journey to get to the major leagues, being a 47th round draft pick, like we mentioned, something that the run that doesn't even exist anymore to battle through that, knowing there was always someone after him and to have a 16 year career. That's pretty much unheard of. You know, when you draft someone when back then, when you drafted someone that late, it was kind of we're taking a fire on this guy, whatever. Don't think too much of it. You end up getting a 16 year veteran. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. I mean, right. Like for the last decade and a half or whatever, there's only been 40 rounds and then obviously it's cut way shorter than that. In yeah. 2020, there was only five rounds. Yeah. He was drafted 42 rounds after yeah. that. Like yeah. hundreds of thousands of players have gone yeah. before him in the draft. So you're right to have a 16 year career, to have all the accolades that he had to be pitching in big games across, you know, several different teams and some of the most historic franchises, Braves, Yankees, and obviously Cubs too. So uh, definitely very cool to hear that. Um, it is cool to hear him talk about the Paul Williston thing, but also like the Steve Bartman stuff because he obviously gets yeah. asked about it a lot. But I think it's really cool to hear that perspective about how he was warming. And back then the bullpens were on the field, so they weren't, you know, he wasn't under the left field bleachers. So he was literally the closest Cubs person and closer than 99.999% uh, of people in the stadium that day yeah. to the incident that happened. And so... It was kind of cool to hear him talk about that. I, obviously, I'm sure he gets asked about it, and it's something that you know sticks in his memory a bit. But, uh, but yeah, just nuts. But I thought, to me, that one of the takeaways was like the cubby occurrence of Alex Gonzalez in the ground ball. Yeah, Gonzalez saying that he's never seen a spin like that in his entire career. Like that to me, like Bartman maybe wasn't the cubby occurrence. Maybe it was the spin on the ball mm. or whatever. You know yeah. what I mean? But like that was really fascinating to hear that. Yeah, and also the stars of the show, I think we're kind of bearing the lead. There's two puppies. Right, There's two exactly. dogs. Also in Georgia, if you're watching on the video uh, of the of the Cubs Weekly podcast, you saw them appear. If you don't, go check it out. It was That was also, I thought, pretty cool. Yeah, so we're in the Marquee Studios right now. Otherwise, Andy's dog and my dog would probably be making appearances, yeah, exactly. at least verbally, because uh, that happens usually about one every remote podcast that we do. Yep. So, uh, But yeah, it was a great chat with Kyle Farnsworth. It's always fun to catch up with former Cubs. We'll continue to have more of these throughout the Cubs Weekly Podcast later this year and in future seasons as well. It's a great off-season conversation, but just to catch up with some of these guys who are such a huge part of, yeah. of fans' memories, but, but like this franchise history as well. Uh, but that'll do it for this week's edition of the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust. Don't forget to download and subscribe to the pod on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And check us out in video form on the Marquee Sports Network app and YouTube. For Andy, I'm Tony. Thanks for listening.